and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is Ellen Rosenblatt, and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tangva people, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. This week, we have an opportunity to support the Apache Stronghold, which is a coalition of Western Apache and other native tribes. They have asked us to show up at the Ninth Circuit Court, which is here in Pasadena, for a hearing on Tuesday, March 21st at 10 a.m. to support their effort to protect their sacred land from copper mining. There is also a 9 a.m. spiritual gathering at Defenders Park near the courthouse that morning. Flyers about these events are available at the table next to the pledge table outside. At that table, we also have letters in support of California Bill AB 776, which is uh, for native tribe recognition signage along the 210 freeway, which is an ancestral trade route of many indigenous people, including the Tongvas. We were asked to support this effort by Mona morales Ricade, who is our contact with our local Tongva tribe. Today's service is led by Interim Minister Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, with music by music director Dr. Zaneda Robles and the inimitable NUU Choir. <laughs> Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on current conditions and the end of emergency orders, our COVID task force guidance is that each of us now makes our own decisions regarding masking and social distancing, while recognizing and respecting others' decisions, both individually and in our small group meetings. We will continue to offer a masks required and distance section at the 930 service and continue to do hybrid uh, services at our 1130 service. With our deep gratitude for their thoughtful, balanced, and informed guidance, the COVID task force is going on hi hiatus, although they will remain available if there is a surge or if the new minister needs them. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge in the living room of Neighborhood House, where the service is live streamed on a big screen. And now a few more announcements. There will, there will only be one service at 10 a.m. on Easter, April 9th, including a new member welcome, followed by our traditional egg hunt and snacks. Deep thanks to the 104 people and families who have made their financial pledge of commitment to neighborhood for the next church year. We have already received $313,000 in pledges, which is 54% of our financial goal. If you have not made your pledge, have questions, or don't know what we are talking about, stop by. <laughs> Certainly an option. <laughs> um, stop by the table on the patio after service. Pledging shows that you are in, inspired, involved, and invested with our community of communities. Next, our next first Friday dinner will be on April 7th at 6.30 and feature a group of Jewish and Jew-ish UU members who will be hosting a semi-seder. You'll have to come to see what a semi-seder is. We are starting a new LGBTQIA2S+ and all the various ways of expressing our wonderful and creative identities that we all have. Affinity group and allies at Neighborhood, and we'll be having a welcoming potluck lunch from 12.30 to 3 p.m. on Sunday, March 26th in Ross Chapel. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the Narthex or through, through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
Good morning. It's such a gloomy day. Let's brighten it up and by saying hello to one another. You're willing Opening words are from the Sufi poet Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of furniture, still treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn is number 361 in your gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit, get your blood pumping, get your spirits moving, and join us in singing our opening hymn number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhood's Director of Spiritual Exploration. I'd like to invite all of the children and youth forward for a story for all ages. Come on up. 
You're gonna like this one. This one's fun. This one's particularly fun. They're all fun. So this book is called The End is Just the Beginning. Today's service deals with change. And we have some change coming here at Neighborhood as we get ready to have a new candidating minister visit us at the end of April. So this book is about change and it's called The End is Just the Beginning, a book of endless possibilities. Written by Mike Bender, illustrated by Diana Mayo. The end is just the beginning. The end. Good night, everyone. <laughs> kidding, of course, kidding. Yeah, I mean, there it is. It says it right there, the end. It starts with the end. That's right. You read it correctly. You've reached the end and the beginning. But wait, how can a book possibly start with the end? That's ridiculous. Well, prepare to have your mind blown because the end isn't really the end. It's just the beginning of something else. Like this beautiful sunset sure seems like the end of the day, right? Not so fast. You see, when the sun goes down, it's actually just the beginning of the night. When all of the snow melts at the end of winter, it just means it's the beginning of spring. If you try to go to the ends of the earth, you'll actually just keep going back to the beginning because the earth is one big circle. Actually, it's not a circle, it's an ellipse. But... <laughs> it's a children's book, what are you gonna do? If you blast off in a rocket ship, you'll reach the end of the sky, otherwise known as the beginning of outer space. When you count, the end of one number is just the beginning of the next number, and so on, and so on, and so on, all the way to infinity, which, by the way, never ends. And there's actually infinity numbers between each number. It just keeps going. Even a sign that literally says dead end isn't an end at all. It's only just the beginning of what lies beyond it. Like the end of a pier and the beginning of the ocean. So, when you really think about it, the end is entirely endless. The end of a disagreement with someone is just the beginning of making up. The end of a mistake is the beginning of learning something new, right? Growth mindset. The end of being sick is just the beginning of feeling better. The end, this is a good one, the end of dinner is just the beginning of dessert. And if you're really well behaved, then the end of dessert might just be getting the beginning of more dessert. <laughs> yeah. The book said that, not me. That's the book, right? I'm not a bad influence. So tonight, when you turn off the lights and go to bed, don't think of it as the end of anything. Just think of it as the beginning of a new tomorrow full of possibilities. The beginning. <laughs> Thank you.
you. As, as a book nerd, I actually love what it says in parentheses here, which is there's a library in the photo, and it says, the beginning of discovering the next book. Ah, nice. All right, thank you. All right, let's sing our children and youth off to their spiritual exploration classes. church. A little history. In the 70s, I first learned about Unitarian Universalist Church in Long Beach. I went to it. The sermon was on impeaching Nixon. I decided that was not my spiritual path. <laughs> in the 80s, um, my family joined the Orange County Church and got very involved. In fact, my kids called it the fun church. They were actually in class with James Coombs as a, as a kid, not a teacher. And uh, Jim Nelson was our minister. In the 90s, Ann Rector and her father Irving invited me to participate with Neighborhood Church in the march at the Gay Pride Parade. Fast forward to 2022, um, I moved to South Pass in 2011, and last year, Ann and I decided that we'd been coming off and on, and we really wanted to make a commitment and join the church, and so we did. Uh, last year, we joined one of the chalice circles, so I'm like, is that like circle suppers that we used to have? And she said, no, no, no. So Anne does the research, and I, I buy into it because she, she does her homework. Um, one, there's so many benefits of the chal chalice circle, especially for me, who this is a new church to me, basically. It broadened our minds. It invited great discussions. It's helping us develop new friendships. And a perk of our cellist circle, uh, ch cellist circle is that someone in our group brings these yummy cookies every month. <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. The topics are relevant and interesting. They're thought-provoking and curiosity-inducing. Anne and I are learning more about ourselves and even about each other, which is pretty amazing since we've been together nearly 25 years. There's still more to learn. And we're changing. Anne has benefited from uh, pastoral care and been in a couple of groups. I recently signed up for Mary's yoga class. I also signed up to be in the book club. And now I'm reaching out to you to be inspired, to get involved, and to invest in a place that opens its arms to everyone. I love this quote from Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you've said. People will forget what you did. But they will not forget how you made them feel. You make me feel welcome. I feel inspired, involved, and invested because of you, you. In the words of Fred Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment toward your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our, our gifts go to the Parsons Nose Theater. Here to tell us what that is and more about it is Lance Davis, 
their artistic director. Thank you all so very much. I'm Lance Davis, the artistic director of Parsons Knows. This is such a wonderful program you have. It's, um, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, this, uh, a wonderfully kind and thoughtful uh, program. Uh, Parsons Knows started, um, Mary and I were living in New York. We wanted to have a kid. Uh, didn't want to raise it in Manhattan, so we came up to uh, South Pasadena where we raised a child who went to Chandler and then to Pepperdine and moved to New York. But while we were here, we came out to do television, which most actors do. They come out to Los Angeles for that TV and film, and we did Twin Peaks and, and Murphy Brown and stuff like that. But our hearts were in theater, and I was doing some teaching at Cal State LA, and I noticed that my theater students, we were trying to talk about Twelfth Night, and they had really didn't have any understanding of the play. And so I said, well, I, okay, do you guys know this? And I said, what about Moliere? Do you know anything about Moliere? And they said, no, we don't. I said, well, why, why is oh, you know, you're theater students? And they said, well, the plays are too long and they're, they're boring and the language is awful and we don't understand the characters and the plays aren't funny. So I came back to Mary and I said, we're gonna round up a group of professional actors um, who we know here uh, and we're going to put these plays on. We're gonna do abridged versions of them. They're under 90 minutes, including a break uh, to get a glass of wine and take it to your seat. We're gonna make it more informal so that you get to know the language and the characters and the plots of these famous works um, by Chekhov and uh, Shakespeare and Moliere and these others. And we've been doing it now for 23 years. We started out at the Geffen Playhouse and we were there for six years touring and then we were at the Playhouse for a while. And then the recession hit and we went over to Jameson Brown Coffee Roasters and we did our Reader's Theater there, which is a very form of theater that was very popular in the 1920s where it's just actors, script, and audience imagination in a live experience. And that carried on to Lineage Dance where we were for eight years and now we have our own place um, at uh, the Turner Stevens Mortuary Chapel up on Holly and Marengo. Uh, that complex up there. Uh, it's a 40-seat theater. Everybody's only about 15 feet away from the, from the stage, and we're performing in a reader's theater style, and we've been there for about six years now. Uh, during COVID, we started doing podcasts of our plays, which so we have now the Parsons Knows Radio Theater, and that's uh, available free to all on iTunes and at ParsonsKnows.org. We have our classic play series, which um, just finished doing The Miser, and we are going to do Sherlock Holmes, The Hound of the Baskervilles at the end of April. We have our women's project, we're going to do a new play by Aidan Reese on April 4th. We have our music series, which is going to do uh, Barry Gordon, Pasadena and Barry Gordon's complete history of the American musical in under 90 minutes. That will be at the end of May. And we also have our Conversations With series, which is a free program to the community where we'll take on a lot of different topics. Um, politics, uh, we just did the, American, uh, the, the landscape of American politics. Um, and we'll be doing other things about education in the theater arts and uh, in the arts and that kind of thing. And um, that's free to everyone. So we ask you to go to ParsonsKnows.org and find out more about us. Please come anytime you can. We'd love to have you. We're sold out this afternoon for our Irish celebration, but we would love to have you come. And thank you so much for supporting the arts in Pasadena. Pardon? I'm sorry. ParsonsKnows.org. Parsons Knows is a quote from Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, P-A-R-S-O-N-S-N-O-S-E dot org. Boy, I hope I got that right. <laughs> and it's a quote from, uh, from the Parsons Knows is in the Queen Mab speech of Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, and it's also the tail end of a chicken where I grew up in Philadelphia. So <laughs> have a look. Please give generously and thank you for your contributions. Secret chairs, they see that out at Fontes. As the deer longs for the water brook, so thirsts my soul for the living God. Sicu 
Thank you, choir. Please join me in the spirit of prayer, meditation, reflection. Let us ground our bodies and open our spirits. As we share in the words from the Native American poet, Rosemary Watola Tromer. In every second, 100 trillion neutrinos pass through the body. 100 trillion subatomic particles move through us as if we were sieves. No, as if we were nets, with holes so big that whole islands travel through us without noticing. It thrills me to think of the self as so porous so leaky. Imagine if our thoughts, too, could clear us with so little friction, so little effect. How many hopes and hurts just today have I let stick? Imagine them breezing through the aorta. Imagine them gliding through the brain, slipping through the core of us, finding no purchase, no anchor. Imagine the miracle that in any given moment we don't fall through our chair, our bed, the floor. Imagine, permeable as we are, we still coalesce enough to look at one another, to see each other as whole. We still manage to pick up the mesh of a phone, succeed in moving our holy lips, and hundreds of trillions of neutrinos later and with total certainty managed to promise a solid, I love you. Imagine with these pervious hands we might carry each other, might cradle each other, might welcome each other home. Amen.
We sing the finale from Hiawatha's Wedding Feast by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, which we are so excited. We will be singing at Carnegie Hall. We leave next Saturday. So the choir. So. Thank you so much for all your support. This church community has been so incredible, just inspirationally supportive of our endeavor to get, get to Carnegie Hall. So this is, the la this is the last time you'll see the choir before we go, go and we sing a performance. And when we come back, we will be changed. <laughs> <laughs> so we're offering the finale from Hiawatha's Wedding Feast as a way of saying thank you. And this is what we're, we can't wait to do this with full orchestra in that magnificent historic space. Thank you.
We are so excited and proud for you and know that you take our love with you. It's going to be wonderful. When I decided to preach about change this Sunday, I really didn't notice the date. I wish I could say I was the kind of planner who would do such a thing almost exactly three years to the date when our lives were changed so significantly, so devastatingly, but I would be giving myself way too much credit. This date has snuck up on me, sending me reeling as I look at the pictures from three years ago with wild animals roaming city streets and most of our horizons shrunk to our own four walls. And yet here we are, changed and unchanged all at once. And here you are, a congregation that is anticipating with great excitement the announcement of who your new ministerial candidate will be in just a few weeks. In just a few weeks, that person will be up here introducing themselves to you, probably throbbing with nerves, just as you will be, hoping beyond hope that this will be a good match, just as you will be. Can I get an amen from the search committee? All right. I have no doubt that you will be in good hands because I have talked to all of the people that the search committee has interviewed, and they... You will be in good hands, no matter what. But I can also predict that some of you may struggle with the change, even if you immediately love the new minister. And I'll say more about why I think that in a moment, but I want to back up and talk about the cycles of change that naturally take place within us. They are deeply human and yet sometimes bewildering for the ways in which we respond to the changes in our lives. I've told you before that I'm someone who mostly relishes change. I like moving to new places. I've moved over 30 times in my life. I like learning new things. It's one of the reasons I've chosen interim ministry as my current vocation. But looking back at my eagerness for change over the years, I do have to wonder at this point what I might have been running away from. I'm not a patient person. Waiting is not comfortable for me. I will not even know which congregations I will be interviewing with for my next settlement until May. Your sympathy is welcome. <laughs> but waiting has a shadow side, which is impatience. Impatience is a failure to be present in the moment, and it can often lead to abrupt and sometimes unfortunate choices. Each of you has a pattern of dealing with change that is different from mine, different from the person sitting next to you. None of them are perfect, but all of them bring consequences. As Robert Gruden wrote, two quick and easy ways of growing old are to resist change obstinately, and to worship change abjectly. In the first case, we're caught like snags in a river, worn down and bleached by the flow of experience. In the second, we are fatigued and wrinkled by innumerable reorchestrations to circumstance. Those who understand permanence as a balance of dynamics rather than a constitution of detail, those who retain the youthful mechanism of wonderment, not only because each change suggests in one way or another a renewal of their world, but also because in the very rhythm of change they find something natively familiar, some inexpressible reminder of the deepest attributes of self. So in all of our personality differences, we certainly differ in our approach to change and our willingness to grapple with it. But the actual process of change doesn't differ. It happens to us, whether we like it or not. We've certainly learned that lesson the hard way in the last three years. 
There's a great book about how we deal with change called Transitions by William Bridges. And one wonders if his name destined him to think about going from one place to another. But regardless, Bridges has given me great enlightenment over the years, and I turn to his wisdom over and over again. And I thought it'd be helpful to share with you as you go through this time. What Bridges says is that change is what happens. The transition is the way we process the change. As he says, in other words, change is situational. Transition, on the other hand, is psychological. It is not those events, but rather the inner reorientation and self redefinition that you have to go through in order to incorporate any of those changes into your life. Without a transition, a change is just a rearrangement of the furniture. Unless transition happens, the change won't work because it doesn't take. So as we heard in our wonderful children's story this morning, what Bridges teaches us is that every change actually begins with an ending. Even the wonderful things we jump into eagerly mean we have to put something behind us. Think about when you started that new job you had been hoping beyond hope that you would get. There were probably times after you started when you found yourself bewildered and perhaps not as happy as you thought you would be. You didn't realize that you had to lose something, even if that something was something you wanted to leave behind. Think about when you brought that beautiful new baby home. As much as you love that baby, there are times of frustration and longing for the times you could sleep through the night. Can I get an amen over there? <laughs> Change is what happens. Transition is how you process it. And if you don't name and acknowledge the losses that come with the beginnings, with any change, they will come back and bite you later. So simply acknowledging that something has ended can be really helpful. In the massive changes we've been experiencing lately, that probably hasn't been so difficult. But when we're talking about smaller changes in our lives, particularly changes that we have chosen, it's important to still name the losses. As Bridges says, the gods have, have two ways of dealing harshly with us. The first is to deny our dreams, and the second is to grant them. But once we've grappled with endings, it's tempting to just jump right into the new beginning and think that we can just take off from there. But again, from Bridges, treating ourselves like appliances that can be unplugged and plugged in again or cars that stop and start with a twist of a key, we've forgotten the importance of the fallow time, the winter, the rests in music. We've abandoned a whole system of dealing with the neutral zone through ritual, and we have tried to deal with personal change as though it were a matter of just some kind of readjustment. So this neutral zone is the psychological, psychological no person's land between the old reality and the new one. It's the limbo between the old sense of identity and the new. It's the time when the old way of doing things is gone, but the new way doesn't quite feel comfortable yet. The neutral zone is uncomfortable and confronts us with the fact that we are not in control and so often we te are tempted to rush through it or deny it or feel like there's something wrong with us because we can't quite just get with the program. This is why my way of seizing change by the throat isn't always the healthiest because there's some important learnings I may have missed along the way. For people who have opposite patterns to me, change can be so threatening because there is this yawning uncertainty about what will come next. They will stay in the place of fretting about the endings or trying desperately to recreate what can never be again. As John Kenneth Galbraith said, faced with the choice between changing one's mind 
and proving that there is no need to change one's mind, almost everybody gets busy on the proof. My mother said something so insightful to me the other day. She said, there's a reason why rear view mirrors are so small and windshields are so big. You can only look back at specific things that you remember, but going forward, there is this big wide unknown that you have to be careful of. You need a bigger vision. It's during these liminal times that we go through what I call the litany of the disses. We find ourselves disoriented, disengaged, disenchanted, discombobulated. My favorite airport is the Mitchell Airport in Milwaukee. They've created an area they call the recombobulation zone. <laughs> and isn't that what we need during a transition, a way to recombobulate? a way to reorient ourselves, a way to rebuild, which takes time. And if we don't feel ready to do it, it can make us feel depressed, out of control, sometimes angry. Last week, I talked about this a little bit, but when I left my position as vice president of the UUA, I needed time to be almost completely disconnected from anything related to Unitarian Universalism which had been my life for over 27 years at that point. I couldn't create the space for my next move without clearing the decks first. And so that meant I got incredibly cynical about all things Unitarian Universalist. It was a phase that did not endear me to my UU ministry friends. And most of my friends are UU ministers. But then once I went through that, I could renew my calling and my belief in this movement in a stronger way. And as I said, working with this congregation has helped me enormously feel that sense of renewal. So these phases of transition, ending, neutral zone, beginning, don't necessarily go in a linear order. Often all three are happening at the same time, but if you don't recognize them and name the different feelings that they bring up in you, you will not truly be able to transition to the new thing. It's a balancing act. The management of transitions is not just important for us as individuals, it's also a process that happens in any organization, like, oh, maybe a congregation. And that is why interim ministry was invented. If you went straight from one called minister to the next, you don't have time to process what happened in the past ministry and open the space to learn what you want in the next one. A number of you have wondered if things would have been different if you had had an interim minister after Jim Nelson retired. It probably would have been. And yet these last years, as difficult as they have been, have given you really important lessons to learn and you have engaged in that learning in a really impressive way. You could look at our now almost three years together and see the embodiment of Bridges' theory. Even though my time with you was a new beginning, excitement for yet another change was probably the last thing many of you probably felt. You needed to process the many endings that you had experienced. This was more comfortable for some of you than for others. As again, everyone processes processes change in a different way. But the gift of this long time we have had together is that we've been able to meet one another on the other side and emerge stronger into the future. So what does that mean for you going forward? I have just a few words of advice. Know yourself and your own pattern of change. If you resist change, try to relax into it as much as possible. If you are one who pushes for change, try to find a bit of patience to let things unfold. It will take time to get to know your new minister and feel your way into how you can work together. Don't be surprised if your feelings are all over the place. There will be times when you are so excited, 
<laughs> excited for what is to come and times when you will be longing for something more familiar. Give yourselves time to work through those feelings. Trust in this community. You have gone through some incredibly difficult times of grief and estrangement, and yet here you are stronger than ever before, growing and practicing what it means to be a healthy community. And most importantly, give up trying to control it all. If we've learned nothing in these last few years, it should be that we are not in control, and yet it's so easy to fall back into the fantasy that surely we can manage everything. Mary Catherine Bateson, in her book, Peripheral Visions, said this, ambiguity is the warp of life, not something to be eliminated. Learning to savor the vertigo of doing without answers or making shift and making do with fragmentary ones opens up the pleasures of recognizing and playing with pattern. Finding coherence within complexity, sharing within multiplicity, improvisation and new learning are not private processes. They are shared with others at every age and the multiple layers of attention involved cannot be safely brushed aside or subordinated to the simple completion of tasks. We are called to join in a dance a dance whose steps must be learned along the way. So it is important to attend and respond because even in uncertainty, we are responsible for our steps. So let us attend to our steps, holding each other in this difficult dance of life in which we find ourselves let the music of joy and love carry you through, knowing that it is above all love, love that will make all the difference. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn is number 1020 in your teal hymnals or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us and singing number 1020, Woya Ya. Our benediction comes from the poet Laura Martin. I will not tell you to have hope in the future. I say, have hope right now. Right now, someone is sweeping the street singing. Someone is folding laundry, sewing a button on, holding out a hand for another, for another to step down more easily. Right now, someone is buying flowers 
to give them all away, playing piano in the darkening day, baking bread. Someone is caring for a dog, smoothing a child's forehead, setting down food for a cat. Right now, someone is working for an end to war and a beginning to a song. For the trees in a forest, for the lights to stay on, for the sun to power a school, for someone cold to be warmed, for someone sick to be healed. For this brilliant earth, it is enough to have hope for now. So may it be.